One of the testiest issues in the debate about freedom of speech is hate speech. Should even speech that is hateful be free? Should freedom of speech include the right to be racist, the right to be sexist, the right to say derogatory things about individuals and groups? For a while, Tony Abbott's government seemed to believe that freedom of speech should include even the right to hate. Abbott's government promised to reform Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, which forbids people from offending, insulting or humiliating someone on the basis of their racial or ethnic origins. This is the section that the journalist Andrew Bolt was found to have contravened after he wrote a series of articles about Aboriginal identity. When I interviewed the Attorney General George Brandis in Sydney in April, he assured me that the government would water down Section 18C on the basis that the state, in his words, should never be the arbiter of what people can think. But the government backtracked on its proposed reform of Section 18C, meaning Australians can still be hauled into court for offending or insulting certain individuals and groups. Is this an attack on freedom of speech? Should people be free to be horrible, to hate? To discuss this question, I'm joined by two esteemed free speech warriors. Joining me from Melbourne is Tim Wilson, Australia's Human Rights Commissioner, or Freedom Commissioner, as some call him. And in Brisbane, we have James Allen, a professor of law at the University of Queensland School of Law and a widely published author. Tim, I'm going to start with you. As someone who has campaigned pretty tirelessly for freedom of speech, were you disappointed by the failure to reform Section 18C? Well, extremely disappointed because in the end what the government was actually proposing was relatively modest. What people don't, I think, perhaps appreciate is even if we had have had the proposal the government put up, it still would have restricted speech even more than any other area of anti-discrimination law. It's mm. one of the great misunderstandings. There's no equivalent provision in Australian law which restricts speech on the basis of gender or sexuality or religion or disability in federal law. And the federal government was going even shorter in their attempts than to establish the same standard and harmonise anti-discrimination law. But more than that, what I was really disappointed about was the degree and quality of the debate because people People just seem to think that if there's a law against it, that that's a good thing because it's something like they don't like racist speech or speech that may offend or insult without realising just how much of a negative impact this has in a free society, in censoring people, in limiting what they can say and undermining our most basic human rights. Mm. James, what do you think about people who say this is a demand for the right to be racist, the right to be a bigot, the right to be a really horrible person? Are those rights you would like to defend? Well, I would defend them. If I could just sort of, first of all, reiterate what Tim said. Uh, I was gutted too, and I felt sort of betrayed when the Abbott government had spent two years campaigning that they would get rid of it. Not a single cabinet minister resigned on principle. You know, the Racial Discrimination Act does not reduce discrimination, it actually fosters it. And the hypocrisy of those people on the left, mostly on the left, who oppose the repeal of Section 18C but are now crying about the more recent legislation that's just gone through, as though, you know, national security is a lesser concern than some bizarre, can't-hurt feelings, Team Australia super sensitivity concerns. If anything, there's a stronger argument for limiting speech with the more recent legislation. I'm against that too, but... As Tim said, it was such a pathetic argument, and the fact that this government just completely caved in was very, very disappointing to me, and, and I think to a lot of people on the side of politics who would normally vote for Tony Abbott. On your question about, you know, should someone be able to defend this basic claim that even bigots or even people seeing incredibly objectionable things ought to be defended, well, of course they can. Anyone who's picked up John Stuart Mill knows that the basic argument is that in the competition of ideas, in the competition of speech, you do a much better job of eliminating or sidelining or subjecting to ridicule bad ideas. And if you stop them from speaking, they go underground, they become more powerful. It's, it's a bad way of approaching things across mm. the board. Following on from that, Tim, why do you think there is this belief amongst significant sections of the public that if there is a law against something, then that sorts it all out, that fixes the problem, whereas surely it's better to have stuff in the open so people can challenge it and talk about it? 
Laws are very bad ways to deal with relationships between individuals, period. It's even worse when you've got 22 million people speaking at any one time thinking that laws are an effective instrument to tackle it. But I think people see things like the Racial Discrimination Act as some sort of a shield when in fact what it really is is some sort of security blanket. It gives people a false sense of comfort that it helps to tackle issues or tackle speech that they don't like when in reality it, what it actually does is, as Jim just rightly pointed out, doesn't change people's views, doesn't change what they think. It means that they just fester away and actually gets worse and this is one of the common problems in terms of the marketplace of ideas that people don't really appreciate is that bad ideas get exposed. That's why they should be discussed. People's credibility suffers when they put up bad ideas because they are discussed, they're debunked and they're proven to be false and that is good for improving the overall state of understanding within society. Mm. One thing that really strikes me, James, is people's fear of speech these days. Fear is seen as something very toxic, very dangerous. Hate speech legislation is spreading around the world. I mean, in Europe at the moment, we have an artist in jail in Denmark for six months for producing racist art. A pastor in Europe was imprisoned for one month for preaching against homosexuality in his own church. There's this idea that speech is poisonous, toxic, damaging. Do you think that's kind of one of the underlying ideas that needs to be challenged in the freedom of speech debate? Well, it does need to be challenged. I would sort of disagree with you to this extent. Yes, Europe is going totally the wrong direction, but Canada recently repealed the equivalent of Australia's Section 18C, and they did it through mm. Parliament, which is my preferred way of doing it. They had a vote. They had a Prime Minister with the guts to stand up for free speech, unlike our Prime Minister, and they actually passed it through the legislature. And all the special interest groups in Canada who said the skies would fall, nothing has happened. And of course, this is not an extreme position that Tim and I and, and you, Brendan, are advocating. This is center-left in the U.S. There are no hate speech laws in the mm. U.S., 330 million people. Canada, this is middle of the road. It might not be center-left, but even the left-wing parties now accept this. It's just a total lack of political will in Australia. My view is that in Australia, the pro-free speech position is the majority position. It is not the minority position. Mm. And so I think I would disagree with you to this extent. It's not people who are afraid. It's some very well-organized mm. lobby groups, many of whom actually are Tim's colleagues in the Human Rights Commission. We have a race relations commissioner who seems on my taxes to have run around opposing Section 18C everywhere he could. We have a president who showed no concern about free speech, to be totally honest. I mean, if it weren't for Tim, my taxes would be funding people who don't really seem to believe in uh, free speech, as far as I can tell. Tim, I was going to ask you, I don't want to land you in any hot water with your <laughs> colleagues, but I was going to ask you about the problem of political cowardice on the issue of freedom of speech, not only amongst governments and leaders, but also amongst the new quangos and think tanks and other groups. Why is there this reluctance today in, in many Western countries to defend what is a core principle of modern enlightened democratic societies? I think what's actually happened in society is we've got past the importance of individual human rights and why they're so central and now they're just taken for granted and as a society we're focusing on much more complex problems to try and address issues of justice and inequality and everything else but what we keep forgetting to do is remind ourselves that all of that progress all of our capacity, our economic, our social, our intellectual progress to deal with those issues is still built on this bedrock and this foundation of individual human rights. And as a society, we don't remind ourselves of their importance. And so we just kind of take them for granted and dismiss them when we look at other societal objectives. And that goes across organisations, government and non-government, in particularly well economically developed and prosperous Western liberal democracies. And I think it's one of the root causes of the problem problem that we now have is we've forgotten to remind ourselves of where we've come from, why that matters, and we're just taking it for granted as a consequence. But do you think one problem, Tim, might be the expansion of rights in an ironic way, and particularly oh, the expansion of what rights mean? So, you know, people now assume they have the right not to be offended. You know, people talk openly about the right not to feel offended, the right not to be harmed by dangerous ideas. So they talk, ironically, in the language of freedom as a way of undermining freedom. Well, Yes, I think that is definitely a problem and I would argue that at least one of the key moments around that was a consequence of 
Franklin Roosevelt's State of the Union address back in, was I think, 1944, sorry, 41, I think, sorry, which talked about the idea of freedom from things. And he talked about freedom of speech and freedom of religion as universal human rights, which I agreed with, which came from the sort of liberal intellectual tradition. But then he talked about freedom from want and freedom from fear. And that was at the point where we stopped talking about human rights as individual rights and that rights were based in individuals and freedoms were sort of how we expressed them and just kind of fabricated new things. And it's just gone from that point there through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but more importantly through the 